welcome everybody here for the first um, regular meeting of 21-22 school year. Um, it's going to be nice to have actually people recognized in person. I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to being able to visit each of the schools now for our meetings. So thank you and if you'd please join me in the pledge. Thank you, Ms. Bothwell. I'd also like to remind the board members that when you're speaking to make sure that your mic is on and you're speaking into it clearly. Joe. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to turn the, oh, I'm sorry. Um, before we continue, um, I'd like to read the following statement. This is a regularly scheduled business meeting that must proceed without disruption in order to conduct the business before the board this evening. Those in attendance will be expected to demonstrate respect for others' opinions, not interrupt the speakers, or disrupt the meeting with any outbursts or personal attacks. There will be an opportunity for public comment later in the meeting. Um, on September 1st, the Dare County Board of Education voted to mandate masks, and at this time, in all school buildings, excuse me, at this time we'd like to make sure everybody who is in the gym or in the building um, Wear, put their mask on. If you do not have one, there are some available up front um, with the officers. Uh, anybody refusing to wear a mask will be asked to leave. Um, as the presiding officer over tonight's meeting, I have the legal authority to direct individuals who interrupt, disturb, or disrupt this meeting to leave the open meeting. It is my hope that I will not have to invoke that right. First order of business tonight is the approval of the agenda. Um, I'd like to also remind everyone that masks should be worn properly and appropriately, covering the nose and the mouth throughout the meeting for everyone's safety. Anyone refusing to wear the mask will be asked to leave, so please uh, anybody who doesn't already have their mask on, please do so. Thank you. Yes, and you're not talking into the mic, Joe. Madam Chair, I move we approve the agenda. Motion by Mr. Tauber. A second. Second by Mr. Hester. Any further discussion? Motion carry. Oh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have an agenda. Next up, we have announcements. Dr. Farley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. Uh, a few announcements with the governor signing Senate Bill 654 and becoming law about uh, 10 days ago. A um, couple updates from that. So um, public school units are required to update a virtual instructional plan by October 1st. And last year we submitted a plan so that we will just amend that. Also is a part of that bill, which is now law. It prohibits public schools from providing virtual instruction after June 30th of 2022, unless the school district already has a specific code um, for a virtual school. So gives us some relief going in uh, through the school year based upon the need um, as the board has directed us to offer the virtual opportunity. Uh, next, there's no public school budget as of today, so the General Assembly is um, still working through that process. We hope to get a budget as soon as possible. And then uh, last announcement, it's possible at some point um, in the future that employees may be required to be vaccinated. So uh, President Biden last week uh, made an announcement about a six-part plan called the Path Out of the Pandemic. And there's a possibility that employees would be, uh, be required to be vaccinated in the future, either through executive orders or federal rules. It's also possible in North Carolina that OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in North Carolina, um, they oversee workplace safety and um, could mandate um, that employees also be vaccinated. And as I understand it, OSHA is working on what's called an emergency temporary standard which could require North Carolina public schools with over 100 employees 
course, we have over 700 to possibly have to be vaccinated in the future. Um, in the timelines that have been presented initially, it's possible that it could be some 75 day period of time uh, before implementation. And then there's also a caveat where employees who are not vaccinated uh, could produce negative test once a week. So uh, Mr. Schwartz, um, any further follow up on the possibility of employees being vaccinated? Uh, it looks like North Carolina has a state approved plan. It's one of 26 states that does. Um, if you have a state approved plan, then the state administers basically a state version of OSHA that has to be at least as extensive as the federal version. And it also has to cover um, state and local government employees. So North Carolina has a state plan. Our state plan will have to cover state and local government employees. And we'll have to wait and see what the, it's called an ETS, an emergency temporary standard. It's like a temporary rule, emergency rule. We'll have to wait and see what the, de what the details are in that um, when it comes out from the Occupational Safety and, and Health Administration. And, um, uh, but it's, can, Dr. Farley described what has been anticipated so far. Um, what's been anticipated is that people will have 75 days to get into compliance. That's none of this is is written in a, in anything in stone yet, and it's not in the temporary standard. But what's anticipated is 75 days to get into compliance. Um, to get into compliance, you'd have to be vaccinated or produce a weekly test prior to coming to work in the, every week, um, showing that you're COVID free. Rich, uh, just a quick question. So that sounds like that's not going to be anything the board that votes on. That's going to be something that's mandated. I'm sorry. Say that again, please. And what you just described, if that comes our way, that's not something that the board votes on, that's something that's gonna be mandated. Right, that would not be something the board votes on. The board does have the option under guidance issued by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to require vaccines. Any employer may require vaccines um, subject to uh, uh, medical exemptions under the Americans with Disabilities Act or exemptions for sincerely held religious beliefs under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That is an option the board has, but what we're talking about coming down from OSHA and applied to the states would be mandated from above. Um, once OSHA adopts a rule, if you've got a state plan, the state plan has to adopt the rule and that it has to be at least as extensive um, as the OSHA rule. And am I also correct that that does not take into account any natural immunity that people may have? That's correct. But, you know, we have to wait and see what the rule says. So. Thank you. And Richard, that's uh, notwithstanding what the General Assembly does, uh, North Carolina General Assembly does or doesn't do in this. Behalf? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I'll have for announcements, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Um, next up, we have recognitions. Keith, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Tonight, we are very excited to recognize some students and staff from First Light Middle School um, with a broad, a broad range of uh, recognitions we have for you tonight. So to help do that, I'd like to ask Principal Childress and her team to come forward, and they're gonna share some really exciting things for us. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Farley, parents, and stakeholders. I'd like to first introduce two of our assistant principals here. This is Mr. Robert Tripp, and this is Ms. Cassie Mount. They have, Mr. Tripp joined us last year, and Ms. Mount has joined us this year, and we're a pretty awesome team, if I don't say so myself. All right, so welcome everyone to First Flight Middle School. We are ecstatic to be back to in-person learning. When you walk down the halls of our school during the day, there is that learning buzz coming from classrooms that makes my heart, our hearts, happy. Teachers are teaching, students are learning, laughing, talking, doing, and it just feels wonderful. I'm thrilled to share our student and staff accomplishments from last year during our program this evening, 
but I'm also going to spend a little bit of time planting some seeds of what this year will bring. Our first recognition begins with our career development coordinator, Ms. Ashley Bassnight. Last year during remote learning, she attended a workshop titled STEM Connect, sponsored by the North Carolina Business Center for Education. At the end of the workshop, she happened to win a door prize, a drone. She had never used a drone before, but when we returned to in-person instruction last March, she started pulling students. They started out by using an app on her phone to guide the drone up and down the hallways. Shortly after, it was the students who were teaching Ms. Bass Knight how to program a code to move the drone. Every time I walked by her room, kids were busy collaborating, taking turns, trying new codes, and cheering when the drone path worked successfully. Little did they know that their hard work would pay off when they entered a virtual drone competition sponsored by the North Carolina Business Center for Education, 910 Drones, Stemerald City, and Bridge Tech. We entered two teams, an all-girl team who came in first place and a seventh grade team who, who placed in third place. When I call your names, please come forward to be recognized and take a photo. Our third place team, Jacob Skoltati, Matthew Williams, Silas Cater, Jaden Dennis, Michael Ariola. And our first place team consisted of Cameron Pyland, Olivia Lilliston, and Peyton Hausneck. And of course, the sponsor is Ms. Ashley Bassnight. Yeah. Thank you very much. Our next student recognition is led by Ms. Charrington. Last year, Ms. Charrington taught seventh grade English language arts, and during the year, she had her students participate in a project-based learning assignment that focused on writing a novel. During the same time period, she had some students who asked for extra writing opportunities, so she sponsored an after-school writing club. This club, Project Publish, made up of seventh graders, had an idea to offer a writing contest for First Flight Middle School students. They worked with Ms. Charrington to create rules and promotions for the contest. Ms. Charrington then wrote a Dare Education Foundation grant to secure a publisher who would work with the contest winner to edit, design, and publish a book for the novel writing winner. Ms. Charrington had 15 students enter the contest. She secured mentors for the writers during the process and judges who would use a student-centered rubric to choose the winners. This entire process was a fabulous opportunity for our students to experience an authentic learning opportunity and taught them a variety of 21st century skills while encouraging their passion to create. We had two winners. The winner of the short story contest was Jasmine Cook, who wrote a story titled Bettina, which was a personal account of her grandfather's experience during World War II. And the winner of the novel contest was Maya Lawrence, who wrote a novel titled The Genius Pool, which came from a dream that she had. I read them both and they were awesome. Please come forward to accept your certificates.
Next, I would like to recognize Ms. Meredith Harris, our Teacher of the Year. Ms. Harris has been at First Flight Middle School for 12 years as a health and PE teacher. Ms. Harris is a natural leader in our building, modeling best practices, taking risks and trying new strategies, and tackling the abundance of tasks that being a team leader requires. She does it all with passion and pride. She has the most school spirit of anyone I know and loves a microphone and a pep rally. Ms. Harris builds relationships with her students and has a unique way of disguising fitness by creating her assignments, by making her assignments so much fun that kids don't even realize they are exercising. She is a tech whiz and during remote learning created unique assignments, videos, and a website that was super engaging. She wants First Flight Middle School to be the best and takes on extra responsibilities, such as being a teacher partner with a math teacher to help with small group instruction. She actively serves on many teams and is one of the best brainstormers and problem solvers around. Ms. Harris recognizes the importance of social emotional learning, focusing on the whole child, and has attended numerous mindfulness training sessions to incorporate into her health lessons. We are so proud of her. Ms. Harris, please come forward and accept your certificate. Next, I would like to recognize Ms. Karen Rogers, our receptionist who is our current classified employee of the year. Ms. Rogers has been a substitute teacher at First Flight Middle School for several years. She was then hired as an EC teacher assistant working with our exceptional children in the extended content standards classroom. As a teacher assistant, she collaborated well with the teachers, supported the needs of the students, and sometimes she would help in the office. When the receptionist position opened up, she knew this was her calling. Now she is in a prime position to impact teaching and learning throughout our entire building because she minimizes classroom disruptions and helps every single student and parent who calls, walks in, or emails. She is organized, proactive, and is my memory, plus a little bit of a backup nurse. She collaborates well with our entire office crew, which makes First Flight Middle School a fun place to be. Ms. Rogers, please come forward to be recognized. One of the most important parts of teaching is the planning. And in order to plan well, it's imperative that teachers understand their standards and know how to teach those standards to their students. This summer, several of our teachers had an opportunity to help make a difference in the lives of all middle school teachers by creating pacing guides that are aligned with the North Carolina standard course of study. Even for the most experienced teachers, this process was intense. It took hours to create the pacing, vet a variety of resources that allow teachers to differentiate and create assessments. These curriculum guides are now available on our Dare County Schools website, so all teachers have them at their fingertips. These are especially helpful for our brand new educators as they learn to navigate their new curriculum. We are grateful for the leadership, passion, and expertise that our teachers put into this project. When I read your name, please come forward to be recognized. Ms. Treva Day. Ms. Kimberly Charrington, Mr. Bruce Gimmel, Ms. Suzanne Blackstock, Ms. Kaylee Kiffner, Ms. Teresa Twine, and Ms. Leslie Wiles. Thank you for your hard work.
Next on our agenda are two amazing individuals, Ms. Day and Ms. Lowe. Both of these educators were rock star English and math teachers in their classrooms, and we now have hired them as our new interventionists. They have jumped right in and in a few short weeks have already made a school-wide impact. They have collaborated with each other and with their English and math colleagues to help all of our students participate in a universal screener so that teachers have a baseline or an idea of where all students are to begin the year. This is especially important as we return to school after a year of remote learning. While waiting for this data, they have been in and out of classrooms, supporting teachers with whole class strategies, observing what students need, and planning lessons to meet those needs. Ms. Lowe has given a multiplication fluency assessment in all math classes, and Ms. Day has organized and implemented book tastings for all of our English classes. Ms. Day and Ms. Lowe have attended professional learning and brainstormed with school leadership to find a practical way of helping our teachers understand and implement the MTSS process of addressing students' academic and behavioral needs. They have created MTSS notebooks and documents for our teachers to use this year and will be guiding our teachers through this process. I'm pretty sure there isn't anything these two educators won't do to support the students and teachers at First Flight Middle School. Please come forward to be recognized. That concludes the recognition portion of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Congratulations to everybody on your accomplishments. Um, before we get started, uh, move to the next item, I just want to remind everybody one last time to please, please wear your mask properly and appropriately, or you will be asked to leave. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have our instructional highlights. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and congratulations again to all the students and staff recognized from First Light Middle School, and thank you, Principal Childress and her team for organizing those recognitions for us tonight. Um, we are looking forward to having Principal Childress come back up here and share and highlight that um, we've really put a lot of attention and focus in this year, and that is some professional development we've provided for our teachers here at First Light Middle School, as well as all of our other secondary schools in a program that's called AVID. And that program stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. And it's a program that the district funds specifically to support students um, that are college bound, that um, are looking to explore colleges in particular, but also careers as well. And the program has a focus on preparing students specifically um, to be successful in the future through individual determination, through individual accountability, through organization, through um, time management, through practices that are just great life skills. Um, we were in a training this summer and we kind of made a point that there's really nothing in the AVID program that's not just good common sense, right? It's just good life skills that help everybody. And this program specifically um, targets students that are in the program with skills. But one of our focuses this year has been to spread the AVID strategies that um, typically have occurred in the AVID classroom for the, for the students that are in the program, but to provide those skills to every teacher in the building so they can be used across the school. Um, because really, we really do think that these skills benefit all of our students, not just students that may be enrolled in the program. So that's been a focus of ours this year in all of our secondary schools. Um, and Principal Childress is gonna highlight some of the strategies that take place in this program. And um, I think we have some student testimonials tonight. We also have a video that we're gonna share with you. And I think you're really gonna be impressed with a, a refocus and a re, um, recommitment that we've given to this program because it really is such a valuable program. So Principal Childress, if you'd come forward, I'd love for you to introduce this. and. Um, uh, hopefully I've not, you know, overlapped on any of your comments tonight. So we're going to bring Diane back up to introduce it. Thank you. Hello again. As you can see, we really have so much to celebrate here at First Flight Middle School. And I would like to introduce our educational highlight. 
Over the last year and a half, it was evident that doing school virtually was not as easy as we thought it would be. But more importantly, many of our students missed out on social opportunities that happen naturally in school. In addition, we realized the enormous impact that our teachers have on helping students with executive functioning skills, such as self-direction, attention, organization, planning, and time management. These are all skills that our students need, not only to graduate, but to be successful in life. And guess what? AVID strategies encourage socialization and aid our students with all of these skills. Although AVID has always been an exploratory class at First Flight Middle School, the renewed energy from central office to encourage us to make AVID school-wide and with a new teacher in place this year, we knew that this was the perfect time to give our AVID program a restart. We put some goals in place that are aligned with our school improvement team goals, and we are ready to take AVID to the next level and make it school-wide. Through this video, I would like to introduce you uh, to Ms. Charrington, our AVID teacher, and some of our content teachers who will share how they implement AVID into their lessons. So, so far, you know, we've been in school for, this is our third week, and already I can tell by being here just what we can do with collaboration, with helping them with executive functioning skills, helping them get pencil back on paper is so helpful for them. One goal I have is taking some of the strategies, the AVID strategies, school-wide and seeing it in every classroom. What it would look like is having our site team take the strategies back to the classrooms and seeing that consistently throughout the school. The power of what AVID brings school-wide goes through every facet of how a school operates. So it's from the leadership, from our instructional practices, from the culture within the school, spreading that message of the importance of college readiness and also just the AVID's mission, which is preparing students for a global society whether it's trade school, a job in the future, and making sure that they have those skills that are needed. I've been teaching here at First Flight Middle School for 22 years now, and I've been with the AVID program for 15 or 16 years. I found it to be probably one of the most powerful programs to help the kids not only get ready for college, but just to do better with their organization and just about anything they would wanna go into. My daughter was an avid, she's now in her first year of college, and it was amazing how prepared she is, one, going, and also just the schools. She applied to seven different schools, um, and Avid helps them apply, and she got accepted to all of them. And on top of that, they gave her a lot of financial aid because they saw that she's a dedicated student and she had been through this program for so long. So some examples that I can envision and some of our teachers are already doing now, AVID calls it Wicker. And Wicker has to do with reading, writing, how we face inquiry, which is questioning and problem solving. Also our organizational skills, so how we do note taking, how we keep our binders or things organized, and also those collaborative structures, which are so important for students to be able to work in a team, to talk to each other, express their views, and also maybe deal with opinions contrary to what they believe. One of the great AVID strategies that I like to incorporate in my classes is Cornell note-taking. We call them C-notes for short, and it's a note-taking strategy that developed out of Cornell University and they proved to be a great way to help students organize information and recall what they wrote uh, when they go back to study later on. One strategy that I like, especially reading stories or working through a text that we're reading, is working in collaborative groups so that students are able to talk and discuss certain elements of the text or the story, as well as using graphic organizers 
to take notes and really pull out the important parts of a story or a text so that they are able to synthesize that information and have a really good understanding um, of the text and build their overall comprehension. We are practicing lots of AVID strategies this year and one that we just did this week is called uh, Think, Pair, Share. And the students were given a word. They had to write down everything they could remember about that word. It was one of their vocabulary words. And then they got into a partner situation where they shared with their partner. Partner had to listen. We talked about listening skills and then they switched. And then when we were done with that, they had to share with the whole class. But the big kicker was that their list started out small when they were doing their own thinking. As they shared and listened, their list grew and their knowledge grew. So I have seen other schools and the success that AVID has in those schools and my dream is to make sure that we have the opportunity for all of our students here at First Flight Middle and also throughout Dare County to be able to have the opportunity to close that achievement gap using and through the lens of AVID and what it has to offer. Thank you. Now you see why my heart's happy. All right. Now let's hear from the student stars themselves who will share their stories of how AVID has impacted their schooling and life. Ms. Charrington, will you please come forward? If any of the parents want to come back here to take a picture of their child, they're welcome to do so. Hi, my name is Jaden. I'm a seventh grader at First Flight Middle School. I have always liked wrestling and I hope to continue doing this in high school. I love animals and the ocean interests me. That is why one day I tend to, I am planned to attend Auburn University. My grandparents went to Auburn and the football games sound fun. I would love to carry on my family tradition. I would like to become an ecologist or a marine biologist. I wanna learn about the animals and explore the depths of the ocean. One thing I found helpful in AVID is to stay organized. I have practiced problem solving skills in AVID that help me understand my learning better. I will also, it will also help me in the future as I stay, start my career and even when I go to college. I think with the things I'm learning in AVID, I will be prepared for college. I plan to stay committed to AVID throughout high school. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melanie. I'm an AVID student at First Flight Middle School in seventh grade. I like to make things and I have always been really crafty. I'm here to tell you about how AVID plays a part in helping me reach my goals. I'm in the AVID elective class where I have learned about organization. I want to go to NC State to become a veterinarian one day. Um, yeah. <laughs> and being organized will help me become a veterinarian. When I start my career, I will have a lot of things to keep track of. I chose NC State because it has one of the best veterinary schools in the country. I have always loved animals and I have always wanted to help them in any way I can. In fact, I actually have nine pets of my own. <laughs> I'm learning all about focus note taking in AVID and in my other classes too, which is helping me uh, learn how to pay attention to the most important details, record them, and revisit them so that way I can learn the material. This will be important as a veterinarian and when I'm in college. There will be a lot to learn, so I think that being organized and focused note-taking will help me keep track of it all. Thank you. Hi, 
My name is Janelle, and I am an avid student at First Light Middle School in eighth grade. I love art, violin, piano, anime, K-pop, and K-drama. <laughs> One thing I love most is reading. And this year, I have read the entire Harry Potter series already. <laughs> Reading is a big part of AVID, where I have learned to annotate text, which means mark it up. It is an active reading strategy, which has taught me to think critically when I am reading information in social studies, science, or informational texts. It helps me determine the essential or most important information. I have also learned how to take notes properly. <laughs> The college I would like to go to is Virginia Commonwealth University because they have a good art program. I have been, I want to become an artist and share my creativity with others, maybe even own my own business one day. AVID helps me keep my life organized by teaching me the importance of time management. As I have gotten better with time management, my assignments are turned in on time and there is little chance of falling behind. This is important because it makes me feel good to know that everything is organized and that there is little worry that I will lose something. When I go to college, I will not have to fret over these things either. Leadership skills I have learned here in First Light Middle School have helped me get ready for the real world, where I will have to make my own decisions and take charge in situations that might be difficult. I like to stay positive and keep my mind open in a way where I can always look at the bright side of things when things or something goes wrong. The personal and study skills I have learned help me put my mind at ease and give me a plan to always improve. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Marvin. I love playing soccer. I also like playing the bass guitar in my free time. I grew up here on the beach and went to Naxxed Elementary School. I'm an eighth grader at First Flight Middle School, and one day I want to go to Spain and play for a professional soccer academy. My plan is to go to college and study marine biology when I think about what college I want to go to. I choose the University of Miami because I heard that it has a very good marine biology program. I want to go to Spain because it's my, my favorite soccer team is from Spain and it's a beautiful place. There's also really good soccer opportun opportunities. I am playing soccer as much as I can for as many teams as I can to prepare myself and reach my goals. If you ask me what I've learned from AVID, I think the most important thing has been that you need to be organized. Finding a way to be organized in school and in your life helps, helps you reach your goals and makes life simpler. Each week, we have a planner check and bonder check, which keeps me accountable while teaching me how teaching me how to be disciplined. Avid is helping me reach my goals by helping me keep my grades up so I can play soccer for the school. But I also see myself as a leader and want to be want to do my best. Thank you. Hi, I'm Skyla. I'm an eighth grader at First Flight Middle School. I want to go to the College of East Carolina University because it's close to home and it has a good business program. After I graduate from ECU with a bachelor's degree in business, I want to become a business owner with my own cafe in a small town. This is my lifelong dream of this is a lifelong dream of mine. It would be a cozy second home and a place for everybody else. I have always wanted to help people with find a safe place to just go into when they're stressed and just be able to do the things they love. Having leadership skills is important too, so I will know how to run my own business and be a good boss. I have learned collaboration skills in AVID and have been working hard on them. I will not have, it. I, I know that having other people to count on will help be helpful later in life and having skills to work on with others is key. 
I have, I feel these skills will give me some better worry, ways to work around others. For example, if someone doesn't want to work, I will have to either persuade them to work more or fire them because they will most likely lower re revenue. Working with others, problem solving, and understanding different points of view will make me a better student, employee, and boss in, later in life. The importance of community service is another big part of what AVID has taught me. College is looking for community service because it is a big thing to know that you are responsible and that you care about your community. Another reason community service is good is because it makes you feel happy and good about helping others. I have also learned note taking in AVID like Cornell notes and two column notes. Note taking is important and it makes me feel better about learning because when you go into class, you only remember about 55% of the things you learned that day. The more you study, review, and process your notes, the more that, the pre that percent goes up. Without notes, you wouldn't be able to keep up with the studying and probably go below that 55%. You will forget these things if you don't refresh your mind and revisit your notes. The things I'm learning in AVID and at school will teach me skills for the future me to be successful and have a happy life. Thank you. Wow. That was awesome. You all did great. Thank you, Ms. Charrington, and thanks to all of our students who shared their stories this evening. At this time, we welcome any comments or questions from the board. I just want to make a comment that I watched every one of those students walk back over and sit down, and they all high-fived each other and congrat patted each other on the back. So I guess they're, they've learned to support one another. That's going to help them tremendously. Yes, ma'am. That's part of the whole Lifelong bonds too. right there. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we'll have public comment. And before we start, I want to um, just read a little. The Dare County Board of Education welcomes the opportunity to hear from the public during its regular scheduled meetings. This portion of the meeting is for the board to hear matters of interest or concern from the public. Public, is not in public comment is not intended to be a dialogue for questions and answers or impromptu board responses. The board may determine whether to provide information or response to public comments if it is necessary or appropriate at a later time. Concerns regarding school personnel are usually most effectively dress, addressed with the administration at the school or central office levels or through other existing board policies and those alternatives are encouraged by the board. Excuse me. The board appreciates courteous and respectful presentations, obscene, vulgar, indecent, abusive, threatening or profane statements or statements reasonably perceived to be disruptive or intimate imminently threatening to the orderly operation of the meeting shall not be permitted. Each person or organization will be granted three minutes for his or her presentation. Uh, we will be using an electric timing system that will provide the speaker with a green light when the time starts. The light will move to yellow when the speaker has one minute left. The red light indicates that the time is up and the speaker will be asked to leave the podium to allow for the next speaker to address the board. Uh, we do have several comments tonight. First is Matt Bandman. When do I start? Um, Keith, is a start? Okay. Uh, when it's green, yeah, when it's green, you can talk and then it'll turn yellow. Well, first of all, I'm going to say that I called this. Um, all the locals were locked down this winter in the off season. Restaurants and theaters were closed. And then, of course, as soon as tourist season starts, all the mandates dropped, restaurants and theaters opened, and thousands of people poured in on top of each other every single day. So all the tourists can come in use the restaurants, use the theaters, but when it's time for my son to go to school and get an education, he has to put a mask on. 
It's ridiculous and it makes absolutely less than zero sense. All these mass mandates that are coming from these government officials, each one of them has been caught in a public area without a mask after they locked down their area. Gavin Newsom in California locked down California. That week got caught unmasked at a dinner on camera. When he was caught, he said, oops, I'm sorry. Pelosi also was for mask mandates. She got caught at a hair salon. When she got caught, she said, they tricked me. So you're telling me the Speaker of the House, a high government official, was tricked by a hair salon, okay? Obama has a birthday party, and they show him and Oprah dancing face-to-face -face with no masks on. Cuomo said you have to wear a mask. He got caught dancing in a nightclub without a mask. Last year, they said, while we're locked down, Hollywood can still have their awards show, but we're locked down. George Floyd... Because it was so televised when he died, he had a star-studded funeral with celebrities, and it was televised. But us commoners could not bury our loved ones. We couldn't visit them in the hospital because of COVID. It's what I don't understand, and it's quite obvious, with the government testing and the media's along with them, it started with toilet paper. Somebody says toilet paper, all the toilet paper's off the shelf. Then came the fuel line got hacked. Now the fuel line pumps are all lined up. It's ridiculous, and I see it for what it really is. The government is overstepping their bounds. They're testing their limits on us, and very little of this makes sense. Even this, if everybody's coming here, this is covered in DNA from everyone. None of this makes sense. The masks, the mandates, the lockdowns, the school, none of it makes sense. And it's funny that you said our kids, those kids are making lifelong memories. My kid can't have lifelong memories because I will not put a mask on my kid so he can't breathe eight hours a day. He's getting robbed out of his lifelong memories. He can't have lifelong friends. I will not mask my child. And those long lasting effects of these vaccines and kids breathing in carbon dioxide all day are gonna come down the road and you guys are all gonna have blood on your hands for, for locking my kids down and putting masks on them. You guys will all be accountable for it. My kid will not wear a mask, and neither will I. Thank you, Mr. Bamman. Next up, we have Bethany Doyle. Hi, my name is Bethany Doyle. I have three kids in Dare County School System, and I'm also a substitute teacher. First of all, board, I would like to thank those of you that voted at the beginning of the school year for parents' choice on whether or not to cover our children's face for the school day. I wanna thank you, I appreciate you, as do so many other parents. Don't be deceived by the size of this representation right here because we actually represent a large majority of parents who, unfortunately, some of these families that I saw at the last meeting have already pulled their kids from the public school system or they've gone virtual. A lot of these parents feel like their voices aren't gonna be heard and they've given up. I have not given up. I want my kids in the public school system so far. Um, the mask issue, I don't know if my husband and I will die on this hill, but we absolutely will die on the COVID-19 injection hill. That is where we draw the line. That is where you see a mass exodus from the public school system if you mandate that. I'd like to first start talking about, I know this is an emotionally charged topic, so I'd like to just give provide personal experience. Like I said, I have three children. I have twin boys in fifth grade. The very first week of school, one of my twins was um, contact traced for being around a child that tested positive. So he was quarantined for 14 days from school. He shares a bed with his twin brother. His twin brother was allowed to go to school the entire time and walk freely at school. When I asked the school about this, they said, well, your one son is essentially a threat to the other students because he could be carrying the virus. I said, well, he shares a bed with his twin brother. So I ask you, where's the science behind that? I think a lot of you already know there's not much science behind these masks. Um, I've watched a lot of other school board meetings and other districts around the nation. A lot of them have provided mass specialists. Um, I know that we don't have any on the Outer Banks and it's to my understanding that you all haven't consulted one, which may or may not be 
um, your fault. Like I said, we don't have one. But when I watch these mass specialists, which, by the way, they are the only subject matter experts because we're talking about mass here. So none of us are experts. But when you watch and hear what they have to say, they all unanimously say that unless you're using an N95, these are a joke. In fact, Fauci himself is on record saying that they have unintended consequences and that they don't work. They make people feel better. He said that. I actually emailed that video to you all. Um, I don't know who sets the quarantine protocols. I've tried to figure that out. I don't know if it's Sheila Davies or the state. But what I do know is that there are counties who are saying they are voting no against the toolkit. They're voting no against these protocols. I urge you, I encourage you, please. Was that it? That was my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Next, we have Katie Morgan. My name is Katie Morgan. I would like to share a quote from the chairman of the board, Mary Ann Balance, Mary Ellen Balance, in the back, in the back to school letter posted at the daretolearn.org, Ms. Balance states, each and every decision that comes before us will be discussed from every angle, and we will carefully consider the consequences of those decisions. I'm sure you remember that comment. Sadly, this appears to be a glaring example of promises made, but promises broken. At the last board meeting, member Joe Topper inquired about having a period of a debate to discuss the negative impacts of masking children, which there are many. Um, his request was summarily dismissed by Mr. Farley, and a vote commenced without any discussion of potential harm. The dereliction of duty in this regard is striking. According to the National Center of Biotech Information, an evaluation of 65 scientific papers documented serious health impacts from prolonged masking, which include staph infection, upper respiratory infection, acne, impaired social development, psychological trauma, anxiety, hypoxia, and hypercapnia. German scientists recently found that masking can result in hazardous chemicals and microplastics being inhaled deep into the lungs. Mask wearers risk breathing in carcinogens, allergens, and tiny synthetic microfibers from both paper and textile masks, which you guys may or may not be familiar with. Interestingly, counties in the European nation are aware of these studies and are not masking their school children. You may or may not be aware, and um, that's an interesting study to look at. A recent lab study from Florida tested masks after one day of wear and found that they were all contaminated with bacteria, parasites, and fungi. And several samples contained dangerous pathogenic pneumonia-causing bacteria. In addition, it is documented that many paper masks are sterilized in ethylene oxide, a known carcinogen. These masks also contain a blown filter layer that contains PTFE Teflon, a chemical linked to lung cancer. We don't, or why didn't you have this public discussion prior to your vote? If you're aware of this information, why would you forcefully and knowingly impose this level of risk on school children? Are you aware that they have a 99.997% COVID-19 survival rate? This is anti-science. If we're talking about science, this is anti-science. These masks make no logical sense and cannot be rationally defended. Um, there's your information, and I hope you guys think about it and down the road make an informed decision based on science. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Next, we have Matt Brower. Hi, my name is Matt Brower. I live in Southern Shores, and I have four children in Dare County Schools. I'd like to address the board regarding uh, the recent reversal of policy on the mandatory masking. I've emailed many of you, and even yesterday sent you information and as you are aware, Union County Schools has done away with the mandatory masking and the quarantine of healthy children who are asymptomatic or test negative after exposure to COVID. 
I'd like you to consider four points. The first is, there is not any conclusive evidence, even in a recent study cited by the CDC to indicate that cloth masks are effective against the virus. N95 respirators can be effective in a controlled setting worn by a professional with training for a short period of time. Outside of that, these masks are nothing more than political and medical theater. My second point, children are not drivers of COVID-19 transmission. The most authoritative article to date comes from the New England Journal of Medicine, which cites a study from Iceland that through genome sequencing and rigorous contact tracing found not one incident of child to adult transmission out of 600 people identified with COVID. The third point, children are not at risk from COVID. Of the 1,925 child deaths in North Carolina reported by the CDC, only six were attributed to COVID. That's 0.3% of all child deaths. Now, if you take that further and extrapolate what our population of children are in North Carolina, you're looking at 2 million kids. That's 0.0003% of the population. My fourth point is that vaccinated people do not appear to, severe, <clears throat> to be at severe risk from COVID. You can look at this locally. As of last week, there have been 360 breakthrough cases of vaccinated people in Dare County with only one hospitalization. By now, I think anyone who wants the vaccine has got it, and anyone who's at risk uh, has gotten the vaccine and is no longer at risk. I think it'd be nice to show our students by example that Dare County Schools actually supports critical thinking and rational decision making. The mandatory mask policy and these absurd quarantine rules suggested in the Strong Schools Toolkit only serve to promote virtue signaling and political science above actual science in data. Please do the right thing for our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brower. David Bragg. What some of you fail to realize is that you represent us. You do not rule us. The use of your gavel or threat of removal is not more far powerful than what we the people have. And that's our vote. I ensure you we will be using them to remove the rulers and replace them with the representatives. I want to address mandatory vaccines because I'm sure that will be a topic that comes up. The board will call a special meeting to suppress the voice of the people. You will ensure that the superintendent will be able to bring in only those that support his position. That was done with the mask mandate. I had spoken to Congressman Dr. Greg Murphy's office at the request of the chairman, and the next day she rescinded the invitation, and only the mask, child, mask the children supporters were allowed to speak. Additionally, the superintendent on four separate occasions passed false information to news sources. On each occasion, he indicated the board had already decided that masks would be worn, but the vote had yet, not yet been taken. I believe these statements should come from the board and not an unelected official. I see this as the superintendent using plausible deniability, being able to back his prior statement back to his prior statement and use that as protection from a board decision. This should not be allowed to continue. A new study out of Israel found that natural immune protection developed after a COVID-19 infection does considerably more to ward off the Delta variant than two doses of the visor. From Congressman Murphy's office, he stated, I am a strong proponent of the vaccine since the beginning, but I am completely opposed to the federal mandate re requiring COVID vaccines. The de decision about whether or not to take a vaccine, like any other medical decision, is one that should be made between a patient and a doctor. The government does not know what is best for each patient, patient and should not be directing medical care. 
We must pursue every legal and legislative option to overturn Biden's unconstitutional mandate. Dare County has a, let's talk herd immunity. Dare County has a 90 or 78% vaccine and recovery rate. At seven, the experts said 60 to 70% would be great. Well, guess what? We're beyond that. So why are we still masking the children and talking about vaccines? COVID numbers of 412 ch children between zero and 17 died. That's a night that with the numbers given, there's a 99.26% survival rate. To put this in perspective, more children die each year of drowning. Thank you, and Mr. Most Bragg. died in motor vehicle crash. Mr. Bragg, so your time is we, up. Thank you. If we compare that to the children that died. Next up is Audie Ragland. Who's that? Audie Ragland. Hey, you guys. Can you all hear me? Okay. I'm a ball of nerves, so if I stumble through this, I apologize. Um, I'm a parent at First Flight Elementary School. These are my children over here. I want you all to see their faces because your decisions have affected them. This is what we've been through over the course of the past two days. My son got a runny nose over the weekend from us keeping him out pretty late fishing on Saturday night. I didn't send him to school on Monday because I knew he was gonna be sent home um, because what does a runny nose do? It causes a cough, right? Um, so the nurse called me and she said, yes, you have to take him to the doctor. He has to have a negative COVID test or an alternate diagnosis. Mind you, he's been in a mask at school since you mandated it. Um, so we went and we spent two hours at his doctor's office. They, um, the doctor was like, you're 100% right. It's allergies, continue the Zyrtec. However, the school is going to either require a negative COVID test, and if you don't let us test him, you have to quarantine him for 14 days. I felt like I was backed into a corner. What do you do? Keep my kid home for 14 days or allow him to be tested for something we know good and well he does not have? I said, go ahead, we'll test him. They did two tests. They did the 15 minute rapid test as well as the PCR test. The 15 minute test, come back negative. Hallelujah, right? We're going back to school. Now, because of the toolkit and everything that's going along with the uh, quarantine guidelines, my son still has to stay out of school an additional three days. That's four total days missed, which you promised when you put them in mass would be no more, correct? Okay, so he's missing four days of school now, waiting for another negative test result when we already have the first one. Um, I don't understand how if he has a negative test result and he's wearing the, you know, impenetrable fortress of a mask that doesn't let COVID spread in schools, why he can't come back. Um, but with that, think about all the time that parents are going to be missing, all the days that they're going to be missing of having, you know, learning, being with their friends, being in an educational environment while they're waiting for these tests, for the sniffles. It's the sniffles. The next six months of the year, every kid is going to have a runny nose and a cough at some point. Um, we decided after this happened to withdraw our students, um, and we are going to be a homeschool family now. And I just ask that each and every one of you think back to the promises that you made about the quarantine and the mask when you told us, just go ahead and mask your kids. And we, we went along with you. We endured through that with you because you promised us they wouldn't be quarantining. My kid had a negative test result and he still had to quarantine four more days. Thank you. Thank you. Kate Car Carino, Serino. Sorry if I mispronounced that, I apologize. It's Serena. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Kate Serena, and I'd like to start tonight with a quote from Superintendent Bartley's page at darelearn.org. It reads, we are more than a school system. We are a family. And I think historically there's been a lot of truth in that statement. However, lately, this hasn't felt like much of a family to some. A large swath of the family feels voiceless, intimidated by increasing numbers of armed sheriff's deputies at these meetings admonished 
for daring to boldly speak up for hard-fought freedoms that others have bled and died for. The family is starting to fracture, and we all know broken families are hard to mend. I'm not certain where all of the animosity is truly stemming from. We are not your enemy. Your angst should rest and be directed solely at the state officials who've placed all of you in this very precarious position. Unfortunately, by way of your seven to zero vote to forcibly impose an emergency authorized medical device without informed consent or the right to refuse, you have each broken established law. Um, you've also violated your oath of office that each of you swore upon being elected. You're also likely in violation of Section 242 U.S. Code, Title 18, deprivation of rights under the color of law, and I could go on. This has unfortunately been structured in a way to cause maximum chaos, pain, division in communities like ours. It's heartbreaking. And it saddles each of you with the liability. Not Sheila Davies, not Mandy Cohen, not Governor Cooper, and not Mr. Farley. You all, seven, have no legal personal immunity from adverse health impacts caused by your forced masking because you alone chose it, you mandated it, and you are the enforcer. All it takes is one child becoming hypoxic behind the mask, fainting, falling, cracking their head open, knocking out a mouthful of teeth or worse, and the legal fallout will be yours. We are in touch with concerned citizens throughout the nation developing next action steps to restore constitutional rights to school children. We're in receipt of copies of their writs, temporary restraining orders, injunctions, FOIA requests. We don't wish to use them. We would like to keep the family intact. We ask you tonight to let us help you. You are not powerless, as your chair implied at the end of the last meeting, unless you choose to be. There are boards all over the country successfully standing up to health department overreach. In fact, Union County, as some of you might be aware, uh, had a meeting and I quote, common sense and law prevailed in Union County after speaking with attorneys, schools do not have the authority to be contact tracing or imposing quarantines on healthy children. They in fact voted eight to one to have kids and staff return immediately. We please ask you to reject the notion that your hands are tied, honor your oaths of office. There is shelter and comfort for each of you professionally and personally in resting your decisions firmly based in law. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tom Serino. Hello, gang. Um, yes, my name is Tom Serino. I'm married to my wife, Kate, over there. I'm hoping to continue the conversation tonight, but switch gears a little to address COVID funding. Now, I'd love to see a show of hands, if possible, how many of you have read the ARC Act uh, program from the federal government. Now, if you haven't, um, may I ask uh, Superintendent Farley, can you please send them a copy so they have something to work from? Okay, another question. How many of you have read the North Carolina State Plan for following the ARP ESSERS funding? Okay, show of hands, nothing. Uh, Superintendent, Mr. Farley, could you please send them a copy of that to work from? Thank you. Okay, because if you didn't know, I'll tell you a little piece of information out of it. The Essers One and Gear One funding came through with roughly about $1 million, okay? And then the Essers and Gear Two came through with a funding of roughly around $2.3 million. Essers Three, which is in holding at the moment, but be coming through eventually, has roughly $5.2 million, giving you everybody a grand total for Dare County school systems, five point, excuse me, $8.5 million. Okay, as you can imagine, there's probably some questions. Not everybody knows what this is all about. So, but on the public accounting, on dare, um, dare to learn.org, and it's still on there now, so anybody can find it if they want, provides an, a, a loosely guided outline of what's actually there. So, of that, the breakdown is $5.5 million for positions, um, $1 million for programs. $1 million for professional development. Um, now, nothing in there, and I've read through it. It's pretty simple. You guys can get through it quickly to yourself. It mentioned, nothing mentions about helping children get caught up in the lost time in class or the education they may have lost. All right, now that, if anybody did the math real fast, that's $7.5 million. Originally, 
the government gave you $8.5 million. There is a question of about $1 million possibly not allocated or missing. So we request public accounting for the funds to be allocated and shown to us. And it appears these programs actually also require some planning to go with it, which we call strings. The strings include universe, universal masking plans, uh, distancing plans, contact tracing quarantine plans, efforts to vaccinate plans. This may all start sounding very familiar. So another question, what else has Dare County agreed to in order to receive these funds? So to end with, I respectfully request public access to the letter from Governor Cooper referred to in the last meeting to unveil any connections to the funding of the strings that may be attached or any, how it may have impacted your votes. Thank you, Mr. Serena. Next up, we have Melanie Brewer. So, hey guys, I'm back. It's so nice to see all of you. Um, what he was just talking about, it sounds like y'all sold out for the money, but that's just coming from me. So somebody mentioned, I never take no, I never make notes, I never make a speech. I go kind of with the flow of what's been talked about. And someone spoke up, spoke up about the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Did you all know that all of the Southern schools said no to allowing black children to come to school? And there was only a select like three in Birmingham, Alabama, um, Mobile, Tuskegee, Alabama, that finally stood up to what the government or the state regulations said about mixing the color of students together, that it was an abomination, it was terrible. Um, why can't we be this school? Why can't we be the ones to stand up against the government regulations, against imposing masks when you go to a restaurant and everybody's crammed in there shoulder to shoulder, nobody's got masks on, yet you separate these kids like they're toxic from each other, you spread all this fear, and they have to mask while inside the school, but then going home, nobody is. If you go to the grocery stores, the majority rules, guys, that nobody wants to be masked anymore. 55% of the parents didn't want masking. Where did democracy go? All because you guys now get a paycheck from somebody that says how we should be treating our students and imposing child abuse and spreading fear. So with that said, y'all are so concerned about health and safety, right? Like that's a big deal and that's why we're all pretending to wear these pieces of cloth that two years ago OSHA said this was all bull crap, which y'all are doing. And now they're mandating laws um, saying that this is effective or the stuff on your face. Sorry. The timer stopped at 110, yep. so I've got an extra eight Absolutely. seconds. Thank Sorry you. Sorry about that. Um, so one, somebody else made a point that 425 students, or 425 children, I believe, in this country have passed away from coronavirus illness. Did you know that the majority of those children were actually adolescents and suffering from severe obesity and other health diseases? Um, did you know that y'all are feeding the food in these schools that's government regulated that causes all of those comorbidities that ca cause these children to die, but also all of the comorbidities that cause people with COVID to die. Because I had COVID in July and I was surfing by day five. So um, I'll read a little blip here. The risk of death from COVID strongly depends on age and previous health conditions. Older patients and those with chronic comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, and pulmonary disease are much more prone to critical and fatal disease outcomes. All of those comorbidities there, not including obesity, so that's five. Those are all actually caused by meat, dairy, and eggs and sugar, which you all treat students with on a regular basis. And they haven't even mentioned cancer here. Sugar is the leading cause of cancer. You guys are feeding honey bun for breakfast, powdered donuts for breakfast, 
And you're also feeding North Carolina pork barbecue on a bun for lunch and calling that food. Thank you, Ms. Brewer. Yeah. Time's up. Our last public comment is Reese Stetcher. All right, I've waited two months for three minutes, which I think is crazy. But I'm the one that stood up at the last meeting. I stood up and made a motion that you guys make a motion that you bring back public comment. Us parents are the ones with the stake in the game. Us parents are the ones that pay taxes, that pay your salaries. And I know you guys don't make a lot of money, except for Dr. Farley. The rest of you get paid peanuts. But not allowing public comment at these meetings, these special meetings, is toxic. It creates a toxic environment that frustrates the living day laughs out of all these people. Frustrates me, frustrates everybody. I still don't know, and I've had great conversations with several of y'all, but I still don't know who is behind getting rid of public comment at special meetings. If it's a meeting that has something so detrimental and important to this many people, to our kids, we ought to have the ability to have public comment. Um, now, why are we here? 90, is it 90 or 95%? That's another thing. We should be able to ask you guys questions because I have a million questions to ask you. How, what's the percentage of teachers have been vaccinated? I'm pretty sure it's 90, 95%. The children have a 99.974% chance of being fine. Why are we having this conversation? Why are we in mass? One in 200,000 chance of dying from influenza. School age children, between five and 14. One in 2.5 million chance of dying from COVID-19. That is straight from the CDC. Why are we here? Why are we still wearing masks? Suicide rates, suicide rates are up 50.6%. Uh, the number of, oh geez, the number of 214 people have died of code, adolescent age children, probably 99% of them had, had pre-existing life-threatening conditions. 260 some people got shot and killed in Chicago this weekend. The reason I bring that up is the number, 214 minors have died of COVID. You divide that by 50, hypothetically. So the state of North Carolina is at 4.28 children that have died of COVID. Probably the majority of them had pre-existing life condi life-threatening conditions. Do you know how many children in the state of North Carolina committed suicide? Do you know how many children need mental health right mental health right now do you know that every single mental health facility in the state of north carolina is full and there's more than mr brewer that your list. time is up thank you three minutes isn't enough thank you thank you mr brewer oh i'm sorry mr stetcher i apologize mr stetcher i apologize Okay, next up we have the approval of the consent agenda, which includes minutes from the June 28th special meeting, August 5th special meeting, September 1st special meeting, um, approval of the DARE Learning Academy revised alternative school accountability, approval of out of district transfers for the 2021-2022 school year, Approval of voting delegates for school year 2021-2022 and approval of the school nutrition bids. Madam Chair, I move we approve the consent agenda. And we have a Second. motion by Mr. Twitty, Second. Second by Ms. Bothwell. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries. Uh, next, we have reports and items for information. Dr. Farley. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, some good news. Um, we've been working for a couple of years. As the board knows, we started what was called, we called an emergent leaders program about two years ago. And the idea was to try to recruit teacher leaders in our school system who may want to assume um, administrative roles. And so we provided a significant amount of professional development and opportunities for about 22 lead teachers um, before COVID came in. And um, fortunately, seven of the 22 lead teachers who are in that program have actually moved into administrative roles, which is great for growing our own leaders. Ms. Mount is actually uh, one of our latest candidates, our new assistant principal here at First Floyd High School, who participated in that program. Um, but in the meantime, we've been trying to, um, for about a year and a half, find a university that could, um, we could partner with to provide um, teacher leaders here in Derrick County with a master's degree program in educational leadership. And so we've been very fortunate um, as a grant partner with NC State, which has a exemplary program. Um, State has had a principal preparation program that's been nationally nominated for about the last 12 years in a row. Um, you can see the some of the distinguished um, recognitions that State has, has received, including uh, they've been awarded $30 million in the last 10 years uh, from the Wallace Foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and several other entities. Um, so the principal's, uh, principal fellow program has been in North Carolina for several years, and this year they opened up a grant opportunity for universities that want to partner with um, local school districts. And we've been fortunate enough, um, thanks to Dr. Parker, Johanna Parker, and the work we've done with State to land a program here in Dare County. So what this is going to look like is we are going to have a cohort. Um, there'll probably be somewhere between 10 and 12 districts uh, that are involved. There'll be two cohorts. And Dare is going to be in a fast track um, program for 18 months. Classes will actually start in January. And um, it's fully funded which is amazing. So the candidates that apply to NC State University from DARE who are accepted in the program go to school and get a master's degree, free tuition, free tuition, free books. Um, they'll also be provided with a full one-year internship, which is unheard of. Many university systems, um, we've had several uh, leaders who've gone through programs where their internship is while they're teaching. And so a lot of times extra responsibilities are given during planning periods. This will provide a full one year internship in Dare County Schools. So this is really exciting for our staff. Um, it's a cohort based face to face, but it is a hybrid blend of instructional delivery. So starting in January in the Dare cohort, there will likely be 18 to 20 candidates um, from across 10 to 12 districts. We're hoping to place up to three um, candidates from Dare who are in the program. And there will be a limited amount of travel, maybe once a month. And so a lot of the um, instructional delivery is user friendly, it will be online. And there's a combination of school visits um, throughout the 18 month period of time. And um, each um, candidate gets an executive coach. Most of the executive uh, coaches are um, former superintendents and NC State professors. Um, there's a lot of specialized training that comes along with this. And um, we are thrilled that we have, um, we opened up an informational meeting um, that we facilitated about 10 days ago. And in that initial um, meeting, we had about 25 Dare County Schools teachers who've showed interest. Um, since then, State has um, held two webinars for teachers in the region, and um, it's a fast track program. So we hope to get um, several candidates who apply. The timeline is swift. So they'll go through, they'll actually apply to State um, by October 10th, and then they'll go through an a interview process. Um, fortunately for the candidates, the GRE and MATs are not required, and they will have a candidate assessment day in late October, as you can see on the 23rd, um, at a location to, to be determined. Coming out of the candidate assessment day, which is very rigorous, then NC State communicates back with us, and then um, they share the recommended candidates, um, and then in the end, it's a shared decision-making process between the superintendent and the um, uh, 
in state officials uh, who's gonna get placed in the program. So we're hoping to get up to hopefully three candidates. Um, they would start coursework in January and then their in administrative internship would be all of next year start starting in August. So we're thrilled about this program. Our teachers are very excited and um, be happy to take any questions. Anybody have any questions? No, but I'm gonna say it's a great program and it's- it, Yeah, uh, it's exciting it be to have to NC State- Training our people. Yeah, to have NC State willing to come out here and for travel in Dare County is always such a challenge, so. Yep. Dr. Farley, do you send the three final candidates or do you send more than that and let them pick up from a group of people? So we hope that we get 15 to 20 who actually apply mm -hmm. and then they would go through the assessment day and then based upon how they do in the interview process and the different um, uh, rigorous exercises they put them through, plus their application, state then ranks their candidates, and then they confer with the local superintendent um, on the um, outcome in their ranking system. And um, on our end, anyone who does formally apply, um, of course, I know 90% of the teachers who are applying, uh, but we do have several new employees who are interested. And so we'll actually um, sit down and um, have a conference with each individual applicant as well uh, to hear more about um, their desires and you know their enthusiasm and motivation for the program. Um, and I've said this several times, and I mean it, hiring great administrators is one of my top responsibilities. Uh, Diane Childers sitting over here is one of them. Um, the principal, besides the classroom teacher, the principal has um, just an amazing impact on schools. And you can tell when you've got a great administrative team here tonight, um, the energy that Diane, Diane's one of our exemplary principals, obviously former principal of the year, they're difference makers. And um, when the studies show that um, one of the top reasons that teachers want to stay in the profession or at a school is because of the support they get from a principal. So. Um, this really could set the stage for us long-term to get more teacher leaders who are invested in staying in Dare County Schools. And as I said, we've hired several uh, recently and you won't find another opportunity like this. Top-notch program, free tuition, free administrative internship. So we're thrilled. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Dr. Parker, if we can switch out. So the board has asked me on um, the board policy committee met last week and asked me to provide a COVID-19 update. So for the CDC, um, transmission status, as we discussed in the last meeting, is calculated as red, which is high, orange, which is substantial, yellow, which is moderate, or low, that is, which is blue. The transmission risk status is determined by new cases per 100,000 people in the last seven days or the equivalent math. The entire state of North Carolina remains in the high transmission status, and Dare County has remained in the high transmission status since July of 2021. So from um, the Dare County Department of Health and Human Services, this is an update that came out about three o'clock today um, from the public health director. This past week marks the highest number of reported new positive cases, 279 in Dare County in any week since the pandemic started. Of the 279 new cases last week, 84% are symptomatic, 76% acquired the virus by direct contact with someone who is positive of COVID-19. You may ask where's the other 24% that's not to be, hasn't been determined by the uh, contact tracing. 81% were not vaccinated and there were 52 breakthrough cases where someone was already previously vaccinated and then still was a positive. So that's straight from their um, report today. So, uh, uh, John, active. can I interrupt? Yes, sir. Uh, any, uh, what is the number of hospitalizations in Deer County? Any idea? I believe it's 15. I'm not sure the period of time. I want to say, I know I read 15 today. I'm not sure if it's a um, two week period of time or what that exact measure was. Possibly from July. Could that have dated back from July or I, 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 not? I, I, don't want to, I don't want to say exactly, okay, Joe. I know, you know 15 was a mark, but the timeline, we'd if have to know. double check. I only want to get facts I know. If you know. So active DCS student and staff cases. So you saw previously on September 1st, the student active cases on the first day of school, which was 32, 79 students were quarantined. Staff active cases uh, then on the first day of school, seven staff quarantine were three. And then when the board met on September 1st, there was 78 active student cases, 399 students who were quarantined then 
nine active staff cases, nine staff quarantined. Since then, we've got two marks over the last two weeks. On September 7th, 77 student active cases. We had a peak of 482 students who were quarantined, nine staff active cases, and six, uh, six staff quarantined. And then today, uh, today's dashboard, which came out about 11 o'clock this morning, there are 56 active student cases. So you can see the drop. Um, and then 244 students who are currently in quarantine, four active staff cases, two staff members who are quarantined. So we expect that number to continue to drop. Keep in mind, um, we're still in a two-week cycle of um, since the mask mandate. Um, so we expect the numbers to continue to drop, um, certainly by, the, by next week, um, and certainly by the time that the board meets again in October. Um, the, there are a significant number, the two um, areas where we're finding, um, the two areas where we're gonna continue to find um, where we've got um, quarantine uh, concerns and situations are gonna continue to be in athletics and in lunch or breakfast, okay? So when all the students are masked and they are um, in, cl in classes throughout the school day, again, going back to the CDC guidelines that we discussed on September 1st, um, if there's a positive case and a student is fully masked, then no one is getting quarantined. The two outliers are lunch, or breakfast, because you can't obviously eat while you've got a when you've got a mask on, and then athletics. And athletics has to do with you know the physicality of athletics, particularly. I mean, we're playing football right now, and, and kids are engaging in contact constantly. Um, so we've been getting some questions about lunch and what that looks like. So the only way that we there's two paths where we could prevent kids from getting quarantined when they're eating. One would be to extend the school day and probably run a nine or 10 hour school day where you're starting lunch at 8 a.m. and you're only putting 18 kids in a cafeteria and you're spreading them out by more than six, six feet or more. No one wants to do that, that's not reasonable. The, other, the only other way we could pull this off is if, if, our, if everyone was eating outside, which also is not reasonable and there's no way that we could ask kids, I mean, it's weather dependent, to go out and sit down in the grass every day and eat, okay? Um, I think there's some confusion about what it actually looks like in schools with cafeterias versus classrooms. So an average cafeteria, which is right across the hallway, we might be able to put um, a third or a fourth of the school, depending upon the size of the school and the cafeteria at one time. Since we started the... Um, since the pandemic, and we started to uh, try to space kids out in cafeterias, we went into every single cafeteria and we physically put down stickers in each cafeteria uh, where we space kids out at least six feet, okay? Um, there are some schools that are rotating classes in, and so if you're in a, 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 a if you're in, um, Manual elementary school, and there's five fifth grade classes. You may have one fifth grade class that, that's uh, in a cafeteria per week, and then they're doing a rotation. Some schools are doing this, some are not. The cap in the cafeteria, we can ensure that there's six foot social distancing, but 90 to 95 percent of the kids across the county, because we can't space, are in classrooms, and their masks are off. And so we're starting to see some cases where. Um, some students are being are positive and are, are being identified as uh, others being identified in contact tracing. It's almost, um, uh, we can't prevent every single situation that comes with kids having to eat breakfast and lunch. Um, athletics is, um, again, with the nature of sports, a lot of that is hard to prevent when you're talking about contact sports in particular. One of the things that we're trying to strengthen with our coaches is um, go back to some of the protocols when kids are in buildings. So example, soccer team is, uh, is gonna go out on the field and the kids are spread out and you know, you're in 120 yard um, field space 
Um, that by itself, if kids are spaced out, I mean, we feel relatively sure in those outdoor settings, unless they're coming in contact, uh, again, with that 15 minute mark over 24, 24 hour period of time, that is not likely gonna result uh, by the letter of the law on kids having to be quarantined. What's problematic is if that soccer team on uh, August 25th, because there's 90, it's 97 degrees out, they're taking a break and coming in and they're in a gym, you know, in a, in a hallway and there's 40 kids on, on the JV and varsity team who are not wearing a mask, okay? So that kind of a situation we can control. A coach should be putting a mask on a student. Locker room example, um, they're wearing them on school buses. So what we're trying to do is mitigate as many strategies as we can, particularly with the athletics, but it's probably gonna be, until this goes away, um, it, it's gonna be a point where we're gonna continue to have kids who are quarantined. Now, we expect those numbers that have been 400 approaching 500 to continue to drop, and then sports, and then some of these situations where kids are, are being fed are the outliers. Um, so I know there's some heartburn, um, certainly um, with what, um, with athletes, and we've had a couple of athletes who have been quarantined twice, and I understand the concerns, um, there's uh, outside of the high school athletic association shifting seasons around like they did last year. I mean, if we're playing tennis and golf right now, um, we'd have a you know, we may have no quarantines or positive cases, or at least uh, we wouldn't have close contact tracing, but we also have physical sports coming on. And of course with um, winter sports coming up and wrestling and basketball and so on. Um, it's, I say this because it's going to continue to be um, a point of um, contact and students are going to be quarantined. But again, the numbers are down um, significantly. And we're also dealing with um, one of the things that's happened since July in uh, testing is that because there's so many people who are now needing to get tested, that results are coming back a lot slower. So there's also beyond the 14 days, there could be a 16, 17 day period of time where kids are rolling off. Uh, quarantine based upon test results. So like in June, you could get test results within two hours. And for some individuals, depending upon where they're going, it might be two or three days at this point. So those are all impact or impactful on the timeline. Dr. Farley. Yes, sir. Um, I know it's kind of somber in here right now because I think a lot of people reflect on what's going on. I, I want to commend you on one step when you're talking about the cafeteria. If I'm not mistaken, you've already taken an extra layer of putting some additional distance because according to the rules, that when, in the, when they're eating, the kids could be as close as three feet. But, but you have tried to widen that to give some more protection. And it just, I guess it kind of bothers me because we are going the extra step to try to put some more protection in and still not being able to hit the target because I know for myself and the majority of the people on the board here, part of our decision was based on what was gonna keep kids in school mm -hmm. the most amount of times. Could you explain a little bit the, the difference um, eating that goes on for the cafeteria? Because they're not all just eating in the cafeteria, right? No, so the cafeteria, we have a very small percentage who are actually eating in the cafeteria and we can control spacing. So we don't anticipate necessarily having to, now again, kids are with each other all day and, and young kids are in recess and there's different ways that transmission goes on. We don't anticipate the cafeteria being a point of high level of contact and contact tracing because kids are spaced. The bigger concern is in actual classrooms where kids are in a classroom with some 20, 23 kids and they are eating lunch within a couple of feet of each other, sometimes up to or upwards of 25 minutes, okay? So the standard in those cases is if it's, um, if it's gonna be six feet or less, face masks are off. Those are the scenarios more likely in that immediate area, particularly where kids will be quarantined. The cafeteria is not the issue. The cafeteria would be the issue if we were packing it. Um, but again, there's no way outside of extending the school day um, or everyone eating outside um, and spacing out where we're gonna, that's going to be unavoidable. 
I do think that the mitigation effort has been, if those are the only two categories, and then the rest of the, you know, you've got a significant number of kids um, who are not gonna be quarantined, then that's, that's part of the theory why the board, you know, the board wants kids in school. I want kids in school. Um, so we can't mitigate completely all levels of contact, but you've mitigated a significant amount of situations. John, other than the uh, cafeteria and classroom, are there any alternatives to place people like, I mean, I'm looking at the gym here. Is that, a, is that feasible to feed children in the? That, the, the, the good question. So, you know, um, if we use the gymnasium, then we're robbing kids of physical activity. Um, if we use the auditorium, we've got kids who are in drama class. We've got kids who are in band. Um, who wants to drag a, a, a tray into an auditorium and particularly little ones? So, you know, we have limited space. And um, I think if we shut down the gymnasiums to put an extra uh, couple of classes in here with desks, then we're robbing 90% of the kids from, I mean, and you also have got athletic considerations, but you're robbing kids from an opportunity um, for physical education and God knows all the social emotional wellness um, challenges that we've got and certainly, um, you know, health and physical education is a part of the curriculum in need for students. Well, you've given me a good counter argument to what I was suggesting. So I'll, I'll, I, I trust your judgment as far as that's concerned that okay. we can't find an alternative to, to do other than the classrooms <laughs> and the cafeteria. It's, it's difficult. And we and keep in mind, we also, we purchased 30 picnic tables. We've got picnic tables uh, across the county in several different elementary schools, but that only can go so far. And again, that's weather dependent. And, um, you know, if I had my druthers, we'd have some huge, you know, 35,000 uh, square foot building where we could spread kids out. We're trying to deal with what we can to the best of our ability and trying to mitigate situations. So I say all this to say that we're still gonna see athletics issues. Um, that will be the primary point of, um, we would anticipate quarantine and positive contacts and then the exchange at lunch and breakfast, much, much secondary, you know, much more secondary down the list. So, but that's the reality. Um, moving to, we're also getting still questions about quarantine and um, procedures. So in the toolkit on page 14 is a review, CDC added an exemption to the need to quarantine and close contact definition excluding students who were within three to six feet of an infected student where both students were engaged in wearing a mask, a well-fitting mask in a consistent manner. We covered this last meeting. On 16th, the CDC continues to recommend quarantine for 14 days after last exposure. However, as of December of last year, the CDC has offered options to reduce the duration of quarantine in either of the following two scenarios. And we have covered this numerous times, but it's a way to review because I know it can be um, perplexing. So those two ways are 10 days of quarantine has been completed and no symptoms are reported, or the seven day option where there's no symptoms and then there's a test after the fifth day, the student could technically return on the seventh day. Now here's the sticking point and where the heartburn is. The last stanza, if quarantine is discontinued before day 14, the individual should continue to monitor symptoms and strictly adhere to all non-pharmaceutical interventions Example, wearing a mask and pra practicing physical distancing through 14 days. And as we covered on September 1st, and we've done um, in other meetings, it's currently impossible for us to provide the physical distancing of six feet when kids are coming back in to schools. And that's why the health department, health director continues to follow these guidelines. If we had an ability to have smaller class sizes then we could offer the seven and the 10 day um, um, possibilities, but we do not have that ability based upon having 5,000 kids in our schools currently. I got a question for you. Um, have, or do you have any stats where after seven days, a student that's been quarantined contracted COVID? A stat where someone has been quarantined and after seven days has contracted COVID? Yeah, what I'm saying, I, how many students have contracted COVID after they've been quarantined after the seven-day period? 
Do we have any stats on that? Sandy, what are the stats? Do you want to share the stats that you worked up today prior to the meeting relative to current cases? Sure. I, I do not, Mr. Woody, have that information, and I think it would be difficult to track, but we can certainly ask our friends at the health department if they keep that information. Um, what I do have and what D Dr. Farley is referencing was just information that I pulled together from our September 1st meeting moving forward. What is on the dashboard and what you see on a daily basis is a breakdown of active cases by schools as well as uh, the number of quarantines. So I wanted to take a little slice to say, okay, so since the decision was made by the board to um, mandate masks, what do the numbers look like just for that segment of time? And I'm, I'm pleased to say just physically from the workload, I, I know we're getting less and less um, cases coming to us that have a need for quarantine. As an example, um, in the situation that Dr. Farley had just described, where students were around um, in lunch, if you will, and they weren't wearing masks or in the classrooms, imagine the, the um, middle school student that is in four to five classes, and we would check the uh, seating charts to see you know, who could possibly be in that circle that we would have to submit to the health department. And that list was significantly longer than what we're dealing with now because now we've isolated it pretty much to the lunch time period, whether it's in the classroom or in the cafeteria. That's the one time that we know masks aren't being worn. So th those numbers have significantly reduced. Um, looking at numbers across the board, um, just during the time period, of exposures and exemptions um, and quarantines from Septem uh, September 2nd until tonight, we've had 20, only 20 positive cases that were directly reported as students. And uh, looking at the resulting quarantines, we had only 52. So again, that's, that's a significant drop in my opinion when we were upwards of uh, 499, 400 plus um, less than two weeks ago. Um, I think someone asked earlier regarding the staff numbers, and there was only four cases, I believe, right now that are active with staff members and two quarantines. Uh, again, those happened recently. Um, I'm, I'm happy to try to help gather more information if it's available to us, um, Mr. Woody or anyone else. And the last point that I'd like to make is I know that we've talked about the the recommendation in physical distancing within the schools of three feet. We take the standard of six feet because when it comes time to sit down and start looking at contact tracing and who we recommend, there's a six foot radius that we have to consider. So we wanna, we wanna try to provide that six foot radius whenever we can so that we can eliminate the, the possibility of someone having that potential exposure. Thank you. And that's a good question, Carl. It's certainly something we can run down. It's not a reporting feature that we currently have access to. This is one of the disadvantages of the public health director not being here. Um, my guess would be it is a significantly low number. I know that 14 days quarantine is just, I mean, it's, it's brutal, especially, you know, when they test negative, but they can't come back after that seventh day. I mean, it's just, I mean, that's where it's hurting us. I mean, we have to stick, do that 14 days. Agreed. Dr. Farley, one other thing, just to make sure I'm clear. The part of the reason for us having to um, to meet to to talk about masks or no masks is also tied to Dare County and its rates of infection. People that are testing positive if the numbers go up. So this is gonna continue to be with us until Dare County as a whole starts to come down also. Would that be a correct assumption? Well, I don't have a crystal ball, but no. when, you, when you when you go by the transmission rates and all the guidelines, um, you know, the school district really is going to have to, and the community is going to have to move in, into um, that yellow level of transmission before there's before you get a recommendation or a green light from uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, CDC, so on and so forth. So. 
the so so the in the bigger scope, um, we as a community. I mean, obviously, this is a statewide. Everyone's high transmission, but the health director would tell you, and the experts, and I'll use that term loosely based upon how some people feel. Um, but the people in, in position, CDC, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, they would recommend a yellow transmission rate versus red or orange. This is uh, Joe Topper's opinion, okay, and I'm, I'm going to register it. Ten days of quarantine after no symptoms is extremely harsh. I'll, I'll first comment. Then the second number, seven days of quarantine, no symptoms reported, and the individual taking the test, that's harsh in light of the fact that now you're saying, notwithstanding the seven days of quarantine, negative testing, you're still going to basically make them do the, uh, what, the six days, uh, the, the masking, which we already have, and then the physical, the uh, six feet distancing, is that correct? So if we can't provide let the at least six foot social distancing throughout the school day, then that is the standard. I'm just gonna say that that's extremely harsh. Yeah. Again, it's my opinion, but it's harsh. I mean, we're keeping kids out of school for, you know, they, they've no, got no symptoms and, and yet we're making them stay out for 10 days and maybe even 14 days. Not my rule. Anybody else? Okay. All right, last reports, items or information related to the conversation around COVID-19. So since we last met, we did open up the um, status change um, for students who were interested in coming out of virtual and going face-to-face -face and um, students who were interested in um, uh, going to virtual. So surprisingly, um, we had 82 status changes, and I thought we would get a significantly higher number of kids who wanted to come out of virtual to go to face-to-face, -to -face, and that was extremely low. There was only 15 students who wanted to come back into the face-to-face -face setting, and then we had 67 students who wanted to go face-to-face -to, -face to virtual. Of the 67, uh, 42 of those 67 were coming from our three high schools, so two-thirds, and um, while parents did not have to um, make a comment as to why they were making the change. We offer that opportunity for those who wanted to um, give us feedback. Um, about 20 of the people who responded, um, about 25 to 30% made some comment regarding um, face coverings, and then the majority of the rest of the comments were concerns about high transmission rates in the county uh, and or family members um, who are at risk. So um, when we uh, closed out the status change process following the Labor Day holiday, um, we ended up with about 315, 318 students who are still, still in virtual. And as you know, the board voted to support virtual through um, the end of the first semester, and we'll revisit that at a uh, different point in time. Any questions the board may have on virtual? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farley. Um, next up, we have unfinished business, which we have no unfinished business, shockingly. Um, uh, we'll move on to new business, approval of revised school calendars for the 2021, Sandy, 22. Good evening, again. Um, on February 9th, 2021, the board adopted uh, two calendars, two academic calendars, one for the 21-22 school year, that would be this year, and the one for the 22-23 school year. Um, each of the uh, calendars that were presented and adopted by the board met the requirements uh, established by the uh, legislation that governed the school calendar creation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in fact, both of these calendars exceeded the minimum requirements. Uh, the calendar set for this particular school year um, had 183 school days, and the calendar that um, is for the 22-23 school year had 180 days and exceeded the hours that were required. 
um, after further review and actually prompted somewhat by the policy that we're going to present to you later um, regarding facilities use, um, we are obliged and have received requests to have our facilities used uh, for election day. We neglected to put that into the calendars that were presented and adopted. And so we wanted to go back and be able to make that an optional work day so that elections could be held within our buildings while students were not in session. So we are proposing and recommending that the adopted calendars that were presented to you um, are again revised, adopted, so that we can then get those posted. And uh, just as a <laughs> follow up, the Board of Elections did not make a request to use the facilities until about four weeks ago. Um, lesson learned moving forward from now on, we'll recognize election day and then have it as a work day. Anybody have any questions? I'll take a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the revised school board school calendar for 2021-22 and 22-23 on the first reading as requested. Yeah, I motion. Second. motion by Mr. Hester, a second by Mr. Twitty. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next, we have the adoption of revised new policies. Sandy, again. Yes. Um, we have two policies to put before the board for consideration and adoption. Uh, we would request that these be considered um, adopted on first read uh, for this evening so that we can enact them uh, as quickly as possible. Um, again, we do periodic reviews, and the School Boards Association provides us with some sample policies. Um, the policy committee, uh, made up of members of the board, meets regularly, so we bring sample policies to that committee for an initial review and feedback. So the policies that are before the entire board this evening um, are being recommended to you for adoption based on the committee's suggestions and the base policies that were provided to us. The first policy that is being um, presented is a revision of an existing policy that outlines the use of school facilities. Uh, it, within the policies that you received prior to and what's been posted, uh, we made uh, a one, one significant change in the language to allow for uh, facility use without charge for staff members and school-sponsored activities. And that will be outlined within the authorized users of the facilities, which also uh, prioritizes who gets who gets first dibs, so to speak, in terms of uh, requests that come in. So that is um, listed under Section B of the policy. Uh, we also then took a look at the application procedures. We want to ensure that even if the um, facility is being used by an organization for which they would be there would be no charge that we would still have an application and agreement on file so that there's no liability issues so that is also included in here um, we also found that in some cases we have um, eager beavers that like to plan way far in advance and sometimes they will um, put their requests in and um, you know, there are certain times of the year where certain times are, are more conducive to certain activities. We wanted to limit the request so that you could only uh, submit from within a year's time frame. So that would allow for a little more competition and possible movement with other organizations that may want to use uh, during some of those peak times. Um, also within the policy, um, we removed language that would um, describe an exemption where the, the, the committee, I'm sorry, the facilities would then have to require um, supervision. I mean, we want to have adequate supervision by the organization who's using the facility uh, as well as any um, school employee. So we took that out and made that a standard that adequate uh, supervision was going to be required. And the final section that um, Mr. Schwartz has shared with me that he's making a recommendation that the committee did not make, but it's on uh, page six and number 31. 
um, in number 31, it states that the superintendent, the unrevised language says the superintendent shall develop the application form to accompany this policy and that the form shall become regulation uh, 5035-R. Um, with Mr. Schwartz's recommendation, he would like to add the language, uh, the superintendent in consultation with the board attorney shall develop the application and agreement form to accompany this policy. And that form shall become regulation 5035-R2 as it's listed currently in our policy guide. So, um, Madam Chair, is Madam Chair, the reason for that suggestion is because the um, that section refers to the application, but it's the agreement that mm -hmm. um, protects you from liability. Mm -hmm. So I thought it would be wise to add the applicant, develop the application form and agreement. Okay. So that would be a revision. Uh, the second policy we're putting before you this evening is the uh, policy that referenced at this special called meeting on September 1st, uh, per session law 2021-130 uh, for the 2021-2022 school year. The uh, board is required to have a policy adopted uh, that determines face covering requirements within the school system. Uh, the policy was a base policy provided to us from the School Boards Association. Uh, we had some liberty to uh, modify it, and we did, to reflect the language that was specifically uh, stated in the motion when the board chose to um, place masks. It's a mandate in all of our schools. And so that language is in there. Um, and, rec and recommended by the policy committee. Yes, absolutely. Um, the policy further um, defines face covering exemptions. Again, we do have exemptions that are available under a medical uh, condition, and we have been accepting those and keeping those in place. And then uh, also, we um, the policy talks about the proper use of the face covering and it provides some detail in terms of the construction of a face mask as it's or, or not a mask but a face covering um, as it would be required in order to meet the standards for face coverings under this policy um, again um, having reviewed the policy samples uh, mr schwartz has made one recommendation um, aside from a correction in the uh, the wording for the um, OSHA, it is not ordered correctly there, and I thought I had corrected it. So it's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and that will be a correction that I'll make whenever we finalize tonight. But would you like to speak to the review of the policy, Mr. Schwartz? Yes, on page three, the last section of the policy, F, review of this policy, um, the first two sentences cover what's required by the law, and that is the policy will remain in effect for the 21-22 school year only. And then the law re requires at least once a month, the board will review this policy and consider the need for modifications. The last sentence is, I think, superfluous. Um, and it says the board will vote to approve this policy with any necessary modifications at a regularly scheduled board meeting each month. Um, you're required to, uh, the previous sentence says you're required to vote at least once a month, you're required at least once a month to review the policy and consider the need for modifications. Um, uh, you are required to vote on it. Um, uh, so the second sentence should probably say at least once a month, the board will review this policy and vote to consider, uh, vote whether to make modifications. So if there's no modifications, we would make a motion to not modify the policy. Yes, or just make make them you know, take a vote to continue the policy as is, whatever. And that satisfies the whole. You got to vote every month on whether yes. or not to yeah. mandate masks. So the the second sentence would read: at least once a month, the board will review this policy and vote whether to make modifications. The last sentence would not be necessary.
Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like to make a motion, please. And the motion is to sever the policies that we are being asked to waive the second reading readings of that is um, revolve, revised policy 5035R and policy 4231 slash 5021 slash 7263 face coverings. Um, reason I ask this is because this is the first time we're seeing this map face coverings and I think we need more time to really look at what this uh, policy is asking us to do. And uh, I hope somebody will join me in seconding the motion. Would you repeat your motion? The motion is to sever the policies that we are being asked to waive the second readings of. That is, these two policies that are being discussed, the use facilities and, and the face coverings uh, policy. So you want to wait you, until... Uh, no, I want to sever those so that we can vote on both of them to see whether look at them separately. Yeah. That... You, oh, you, you want to waive the re you want to waive the second reading? No, no. <laughs> I, I, I want to sever the two policies to make sure that we're voting separately. Oh, separately on each policy. Each I understand. I got you, Madam Chair. There's no there's no need for a motion to do that. You can just simply make a motion to deal with the first policy alone, then, if you'd like. And then that'll just leave the second policy. To okay, do. I'll, I'll do that. I, I, I make a motion that we waive the second reading of the policy as it relates to uh, re revised policy 5035R. The use of facilities one. Correct. Okay. So a motion by Mr. Tauber to approve policy 5035, use of facilities. Second. No, the, the motion was to waive the second reading Wave the second reading of 5035 and a second by Mr. Twitty. So Mr. Tauber waves the motion or makes a motion to waive the second reading. Okay. And David approved or uh, seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. So now you have to make a motion to approve. Okay. For the facilities use policy. Yeah, you, you, if, correct me if I'm need wrong. a motion to approve policy 5035 as amended. Yes, I see. Uh, Madam Chair, I move we approve uh, revised policy 5035R use of facilities and policy. You know, it, that's it's just 5035, not R. No R. Okay, a motion by Mr. Tauber to approve policy 5035 use of facilities. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Hester. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Now we're down to the face coverings. Does Madam this have to be approved at this meeting? It, it does not. We can approve it at the next meeting in the original one stand yes. because we did that on September 1st. You may. Yeah. Okay. So you want to, we, we are not so he's got to make a motion to um unless somebody makes a motion to waive the second reading it's not going to be approved tonight okay is it mandated that we have to approve it tonight no that's what no. i just asked he said no, no you've already adopted because a policy it it's not 1st. a formal policy okay. um you you're moving towards adopting a formal policy but you do have a policy in place that you adopted okay. so you're good okay so we don't have to make a motion to table that to next month. As long as everyone's copacetic with that, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Put your microphone on. I'm not waiving the second reading. I, I want some more time to spend with this. Right. Okay. Right. We'll, that's we'll exactly we'll what we're saying. We're not going to vote on this tonight. Just wanted to be clear on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got board consensus to defer consideration of this to yes. second reading at, at the next meeting. Yes. Okay. If that is all, I will take a motion to adjourn. Madam Chair, I move we adjourn. Mm -hmm. Second. Madam second. Chair, a motion by Ms. Lawler, a second by Mr. Twitty. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.